All right, yeah, so we'll look at uh, the part two. It's for ratings of 1,000 to 11.99. So if you're a class E player, then this is perfect for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let, we'll read some of this nonsense that he says first. Because, you know, he spent the time to put it in here. I'm going to read it. Sweetie. He said his first rating was 1068. Pretty solid. But aside from the uh, overkill mates that we looked at in part one, he didn't know anything at all about endgame. So all he knew was how to mate with a queen or mate with two rooks and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't affect him too much because most of the games that he won and lost were not in the endgame, right? That's usually the case. But now that he's an international master, he's aware of the plight of the beginning tournament player. This and, is Silman we're talking about, in case yeah. you didn't say that. Okay. And uh, he can't allow the level of endgame ignorance that he possessed when he was in class E. Um, so in part two, you'll learn what material advantage do and don't win. And you'll take your first steps into the world of serious endgame knowledge. You'll develop an appreciation for the powers of the king and the mysteries of opposition. Ooh. <laughs> and the and drawing proclivities of rook and pawn endgames. All right, so when you reach a position where your opponent has not lost everything but his king, which can't be captured, it's a must to know which material you'll need to force checkmate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can save many positions by leaving your opponent with an insufficient mating material. So obviously a queen can mate, or a rook, or two bishops, mm -hmm. and a bishop and knight. So all of those things can mate. If you have a two bishop and knight, you can mate. A pawn by itself can't mate unless it's promoted. A bishop by itself can't mate, and a knight can't mate. Even two knights can't mate by force. You need your opponent's help for that. Mm -hmm. So we've seen in part one the king and rook, or more, versus the king mates easily. So the first three items need no comment. Two bishops is too complex for this section, but will be ex examined later in the book. Mm -hmm. Bishop and might, knight might never occur in your whole chess lifetime, although I've had it twice. And it's far too difficult to waste your precious study time on. In fact, in this book, they won't examine bishop and knight at all. They won't. You're not going to learn this at all if you read this book, bishop and knight. Mate. Pretty. Uh, I thought you would. I would think he would yeah. cover that. Well, is it too advanced? Why is he, he not? He just says it's. Uh, you might never have it, and you shouldn't even waste time studying it. Is what he says. I don't agree with that. I agree with the not ever having it part. It's fun. Well, if you never have it, then why should you waste your time? How it, can you agree with fun. one part but the other? Yeah, because uh -huh. it's fun. There is a, There can be reasons other than not encountering it. Well, this uh, isn't a book for fun, you know. It's a book to learn the end game efficiently. Well, but I agree that it should be in here. Honestly. I mean, it, for completeness, why would I don't? That didn't even make sense. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> the basics of a lone pawn will be presented here in part two, and a deeper knowledge of king and pawn end games will be presented in parts three and four. Bishop and knight are sad facts. You can't mate with just one bishop or just one knight. Just one minor piece isn't enough to mate. And also it's the same for two knights against a king. We'll look at that even first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up two pieces, you would think that should generally win, right? But it's not the case. Let's take a look at why. Let me see what chat's saying. Two same colored bishops is neuronum. <laughs> <laughs> Very unlikely to have that. You had to promote to a mm -hmm. bishop and it had to be on the same color and then you lost everything else. <laughs> it does happen in Ben's stream a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a little mechanical because he gives everything away until he has bishop and knight. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. But yeah, I've had it in two, uh, in two serious tournament games. All right, let's take a look at this. That's a good point, Jimbo, actually. That if you study that the mate, the knight and bishop, that just yeah. coordinating. I would agree with that. Yeah, I do agree with with that. That does make sense. Yeah, you sense. could just learn about the pieces, not yeah. necessarily for just that specific mate. Right. Anyway. A very funny chess with OP, but obviously it's Black's turn. <laughs> and Black is in check. That's why it's obviously Black's turn. One move loses and one move draws. And it's pretty obvious that, well, generally you don't want to move towards the corner, right? That's easier to get checkmated in. Mm -hmm. Mate. Nice. If he moves here, obviously there's no mate. And this is the problem. You can't force the guy ever to go into the corner. They have to be very, uh, you know, compliant with you. 
they have to coordinate their effort to lose on purpose. Otherwise, you can't win with this material. This mm -hmm. is like the best position you can you can get by force, basically. But then uh, they can just not get <clears> mated. <throat> they can just choose not to get mated. Yeah. So too bad for the two knights, huh? The first thing that's understood is that white only has a chance to deliver a mate if black blunders. That's what I said. Two knights can ever force a mate. It takes help from the defender. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay, so he says all the stuff I said. Since the vast majority of blunder mates in this endgame occur in the corners, make sure you dance away from the corners if you're defending. That makes sense. Yeah, this is Selman's complete endgame book. We're just, we decided to go through it. Not every stream, but we'll every two or three streams we'll do another chapter or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, plus, Ovi, can't you read the... Uh, the title of the you know the title of the stream says the name of the book, King H eight X Clan Better for White. Yeah, all right. So that's all that we have to say for that. There's nothing else you need to know about two nights. Right. I knew that already. Now let's look at minor piece versus queen. Inexperienced players occasionally think that a lone minor piece like a bishop or knight might be able to put up some resistance against a queen, but that's not true. We'll explore both possibilities, a bishop against a queen or a knight against a queen, and demonstrate beyond a shadow of any doubt that the minor piece is completely outgunned. And who would think they wouldn't be? Well, he, I mean, he said that some lower-rated players think that. All right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that. <laughs> I'm not that low-rated. So sad being up two knights and can't win unless you flag them. <laughs> That's true, Master John. Well, a lot of times the game just ends if it's two knights because mm. it's insufficient mating material. Yeah, yeah. If, All right. If Kent and the USCF, um, you could just get the TD if your opponent won't agree, right? I'm not sure, really, if t when it's two knights. I'd have to you know, look it up. I, right, I, I would have to look it up, too. Mm -hmm. Because you can. it's theoretically possible to mate, but mm -hmm. it, it, it says in the book, like, these circumstances, you, it, the, it's just the game draws, like, automatically. Mm -hmm. And it has, like, a list of circumstances. And generally, TDs should not interfere. So maybe they let it play out in case the, um, they do blunder, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. It's probably I what know. they should do. I mean, I yeah, I never interfere. It's right? probably what they yeah, that's probably the rule. Anyway. Um, so Three here minutes. it's black to play. Otherwise, bishop g7 would be a good move. So black has to promote immediately. Let's get a queen. That's the best one. Yeah, great wolf. What about two knights and a pawn? Um, yeah, if your opponent has a pawn, you can win by force sometimes. And so that if you can win by force, you would never stop the game, right? Yeah, right, definitely. And I think in the other case, you probably wouldn't either. I was just curious. All right. Have to look it up though. Yeah, USCF and FIDE probably do have different rules for that kind of stuff. That's true. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's important that you queen them right away. Um, so all you have to do is be careful not to play a move like that and get skewered, right? Yeah. And it should be like a pretty clear win. <clears throat> In a queen versus dark square bishop endgame, stay on light squares as often as possible. In fact, that's a good idea in the middle game, too. Like, if your opponent has a dark square bishop and you don't, yeah. you should put your pieces on white squares if possible. Mm -hmm. All right, so bishop d6. Okay. Gotta use the king to help, right? Gotta Komsky use that king to help. Turn the page. Like Bob Seeger. Check. Oh, wait, wait, that's not check. Check. There we go. I'm learning the notation, you guys. King e5. So black will patiently kick the enemy king around a bit after some prodding, giving ground to black's king. Check. King f5. Check. Now this finally pushes the king back. King has to go back. You can't go here. Why not? Um. Well, you'll lose the bishop. Wait. You can't go there. It's not mate. 
I didn't say it was. Oh. Um... I'm guessing you'll lose the fish. Oh, yeah, you'll get forked. Is that not it? No? Well, you didn't tell me move. I don't know. Oh. What, what you mean, queen um, e5? No, bishop takes queen would be good, though. Okay. If king f4, then you could go... Um, oh, no, the king could protect it, though. Queen h6, you mean? Yeah. Got to decipher what you're saying. Oh, sorry. Then the king e5. Yeah, I can say square. I'm sorry. Um, so why not king f4... Oh, chat's got it. Um, let's see. Go Aronian. Well, I mean, you'd still just lose the bishop. I don't see a mate. Is there a mate that I'm missing? Uh, nope, you can't mate unless you're on the back row. We learned right. that in part one. I know, so I don't understand. Well, well you well, won't tell me the move that wins. Well, okay, you could go queen d5 and get the bishop. I just moved the bishop away. Um, you got to look at your checks. You got to look at all your checks. That's how you're going to win the bishop. All right, let's see if I go queen h2. Let me see what happens. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, queen, queen h2. Queen h2 Skewer. wins the bishop. Skewer, yeah. Exactly, right. So you got to move the king back in that in this case because queen h2 would win the bishop. Mm -hmm. Check. King f6. So now we can bring the king upwards, yes. Black's king will always step closer to white's whenever it's possible to do so, yes. Bishop f8, always play that. Don't want to move the bishop too far from the king because then it can get forked and skewered like how we saw. Right. So you've got to keep it close. And then we can make that box. Love the box, right? We learned that in part one. <laughs> It'll put you in a box alive, but just barely. <laughs> Fork, but we can go here. And yes, we bring the king in, tighten it up. Tighten the knees. Yes. Now uh, now it's kind of tough because you have to sort of move the, the bishop far away. You know, if you go here, you get forked. All right? Even if you go here, it's a fork. Mm -hmm. So let's just go as far away as we can. Bloop. There you go. No forks right now. Queen g6. Yeah. Now, if you go king f8, because remember we just said you don't want to go in the corner when it was like the two knights. Mm -hmm. If you go king f8, here's a nice benefit of white having a bishop, is that white can't get stalemated. So this the position that we looked at last week is normally stalemate. But obviously it's not here because we have an extra bishop. Right. So you just move your bishop to a random square, not like a knight, but you know, like a bishop, mm -hmm. and then mate. So king h8 is the better defense in this case. Doesn't get mated immediately. Well, it takes another move or two, I guess. And then king e6. Again, we don't need to go to it. You could go. That's no problem, actually. But we might as well stay on stay the white, the white square, square, yeah. here. And he wants to go to king f7 and mate. Or mate, or mate. Bishop e7. White misses, king takes bishop, right? Well, no, I mean, it's you don't need it. Yeah. It's stalemate. Well, and, you, and you, there's no reason to do that. Anymore. All right, yeah. Just go in. Go in for the mate. Mm. Bishop f8, because I always play bishop f8. But, okay, we got mate in one and mate in two. So we'll just mate him. So black mm. won by treating the endgame as a king and queen versus king endgame. The bishop was more of a ghost than a threat. And it actually even helped... Black avoids stalemate, as we saw. Nice. Use True. your opponent's pieces against them. Stalemate Steven. Thanks <laughs> <Strikes> again. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Aronian, oh, Luki. Hey, Luki Pookie. Aronian always decides to play 10 times better in St. Louis Rapid and Blitz than any other event. 
And then Neuronotum says Dominguez is beating the hell out of Nakamura in an end game. <laughs> yeah, Dominguez likes a good end game. That's for sure. Yeah. Ah. I would say Nakamura doesn't like a good end game. Or a bad end game. All right. So we'll try a knight against queen. Now, obviously, knights are a little bit trickier mm -hmm. than bishops. You always got to watch out for getting forked. Like, you don't want to go here, for example. Fork town. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, yeah, he even says this. Don't get forked. Knights are tricky. Yeah, this does seem ripe for it getting forked. So king h2. And then queen d4. The queen moves up and takes commands of, of a few more squares. White's king and queen will continue to do that. Slowly but surely. Stop calling him surely, though. Useful advice. In an endgame, the stronger side's plan is easy. Push the enemy king to the side of the board and mate it. However, don't let the knight fork your king and queen in this case. Yeah? What do you think you would do here with white? Um. Let's see. Oh, you're trying to get him closer to the edge. Living on the edge. <laughs> But also, don't forget to bring your king up. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you could either go queen e4, or you could bring, just bring the king in. But What king move? Um, well, you can't go king g3. Exactly. See, that's what black was hoping for. Oh. Yeah, black was hoping for the old king g3, knight f5, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, he does play queen e4 check, just to get out of the fork. Right. This doesn't really actually help black or help white move the king backwards. Right. The king just goes go to the side, goes here. True. But now he won't get forked. Also, you'll notice that it's impossible to fork them when they're on different colors. Mm hmm That's yeah, usually the case with almost every piece except like a queen or a rook, I guess. But with, with most pieces, and even queen and rook usually, same color. But with most of like a knight or a pawn or a bishop, they need to be on the same color. So you got to, uh, and those are more often forking than major pieces. Oh, Dominguez threw it away. Darn. Dang. <laughs> and oh, dang, tough Dominguez. Let's go to Fork Just Town. Says red. Great Wolf. I'm gonna make a Fork Town emote. All right. I already have. That's a good one. I have it in my head what it's gonna look like. Here. Just gotta do it. Trying to get get going. Now, if I had black, I would like go here illegally and just hope my opponent doesn't call me on it. Not really. I'm not Kasparov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'm not really understanding the exact um, method to this situation here. Oh, he's just bringing the king and queen in closer mm -hmm. to the black king and avoiding the forks. That's all he's doing. Yeah. That's all you need to do. So he wants to check and bring the king closer. can't move the knight because it was pinned, so he actually gets the king closer mm -hmm. immediately. King f5, knight d7. King e7, he also gives this variation. King c6, king e6, check king e7, king b5, king d6. So you can see white's making progress now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a drill. I should practice this to make sure I can do it. They have this particular drill on chess.com. Oh, yeah? Queen against knight? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I did a while back. I could do it, but it's, you know, I, I'm i going to admit I got forked. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I did, but I was able to do it. But, you know, you got to really watch the forks. It seemed like a couple mm -hmm. of times until I got the hang of it. I haven't done it in a while that the king would sort of run around on the other side of the knight, too, but... Right. Yeah, definitely out. that's the right defense. Like a knight shield. He uses knight like a shield. All right, like, let's say he goes here. What would you do with white? Um... Probably, let's see, queen e5. Yeah, queen e5 is good. Because then you're both attacking the knight, you don't, you know... Also, queen e6 is pretty good. 
Um, but then he, um, okay, is that better? No, just winning the night's good. <laughs> Definitely. Both those moves are good. Yeah. And just don't go queen e6 and then play king takes. That would be a boo-boo. A okay. Play queen takes so you don't stalemate him. Or queen e5 and then queen takes. Yeah. Yeah, once you get to the edge of the board and it's easy to get the knight. Yeah, I remember th the first couple because a couple of times there I did get forked. <clears throat> Can't allow him to take it. So finally we pushed the king back to the back row. Mm -hmm. To Etienne back row. And step up. Threatening mate in one. Check. Still threatening mate in one. So he's got to cover that. All right, maybe you can find the killer move. Um, let's see. This will end all resistance. <laughs> um. It's probably even more than one good move. But now we're getting to the, uh, you know, the end of the rope here for black. Let's see. Killer move. Killer is me. Let me make sure I'm not about to... <clears throat> That's not right, Nero no, no. What are you talking about? Uh, let's see. Your chest with Ovi's got it. Seems like maybe, uh... Queen... Let me see, maybe Queen H7. Oh no, because then he just protects it. Oh no, he can't. Um... Yeah, what about Queen H7? Yeah, queen h7 is fine. Queen g7 and queen h7 yeah. are equally good moves. And then, yeah, and then the knight moves and then it's mate. Right. Yeah, yeah. queen g7 is what he gives, and what that's what Ovi wanted. Mm -hmm. Any knight move allows the mate. So here, but then we can still mate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as we saw, to safely win this endgame, you should always be on the lookout for knight forks. That's the biggest one. Got to use your king and queen as a team, just like we saw in part one. And chase the enemy king to the side of the board, again, like part one. And you got to be patient. Just because mm -hmm. you're up a queen for a knight doesn't mean you have to win immediately. That's true. Take your time. Move your king sideways in the end game. <laughs> yeah, but king e6 would have been knight f8 check again. You know, we just had this position. You know, and then you'd play queen g7. I guess. <laughs> Scottish demon goes, says, I'm still going to get forked when I get <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> All right, yeah. so that's enough for queen against minor piece. We saw both examples. Now yeah. let's start. Oh, are you I'm sorry. Something? Well, see how Smith was asking if you've ever gotten this in a game, in a serious game. Not me. Mm. But if I did, my opponent would resign. So. And if, you know, they resigned 20 moves ago. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, everybody can practice this if you need practice, which a lot of you don't. Oh, definitely, On it's, it's something that you need to practice, you know, <laughs> yeah, I would say. Yeah, I should go back and do it again. I could do it, it's just I had to practice a few times before I could do it. Now I'm probably slower again. Just keep your king and queen on different color, color squares. squares. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. But sometimes you have to put them on the same color square. Mm -hmm. That happens. Yes, you don't get forked, but yeah. Players that are starting out tend to think of the king as an annoyance, something that demands protection. But, uh, yeah, in the end game, you can use it actively, right? And Steinitz liked to use his king, attack with the king. Mm -hmm. It's not too smart, but, you know, <laughs> he liked to do it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And chess in the opening and middle game is dangerous for the kings. Um, 
the enormous threat of the enemy pieces crashing through and mating the king to, to makes teachers teach the students to ca get castled and activate the rooks and such and leave the king behind. But wisdom in one situation isn't always wisdom in another. That's true. And passing to the end game, the king is a very strong piece, at least as strong as a bishop or knight. In fact, I remember Lasker said that the king is better than a knight in the end game. That's what Lasker said. Hmm. I'm not sure if that's true, but you know, he said it. <laughs> But, um, yeah, a lot of times lower-rated players, they just keep their king back because they're afraid, you know, like in the middle game. But with minimum, with minimum, minimal material remaining on the board, both players need to make use of everything they have left. And, yeah, pawns are the same way. Pawns get a lot better in the end game too. In fact, kings, pawns, and rooks, those three, get better in the end game than they are in the middle kings, game. Yeah, okay. Kings, pawns, and rooks are better in the end game than they are in the middle game. And minor pieces are better in the middle game. Okay. Than they are sense. in the end game. Um, but still, you gotta pay attention when you're like activating your king in an end game. You can still get forked and get a tactic if it's like a night end game or, or something like that. So never forget that the king is a, a tactical liability. Mm -hmm. It's not just the king's getting mated all the time. Let's see. Useful advice. In the end game, pawns and the king take on enormous significance. In general, when the endgame is reached, rush your king to the center of the board. Yes. So because of the king's importance, the tournament E player, which is this, you know, this section, needs to take the first steps in understanding the basic movements of the king and the white and black king's relation to each other. It's very important to look over the following examples again and again until the ideas are fully absorbed. But we'll, we won't be doing that. <laughs> Just <laughs> once. Let's take a look at a critically important endgame that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. This one. Black to move. So white cannot mate with a king and a pawn. Everybody knows that. Uh, but if the pawn promotes, obviously, then you're in business. Even a rook will do, as we saw in the first part. So white wants a new king, a new queen, um, but black can stop this from happening, and it's going to lead to a draw. So let's look at this king d6. Yeah, I knew legal moves weren't on because it didn't. Yeah. But that's still black's turn, of course. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, there we go. King e4. Opposition, right? Come on. Go over this way, right? But opposition again. And then stalemate. Now, I should say that the best move for white here is this. I'm sure you'll take the pawn and draw, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a non zero chance that somebody might eventually play king e7. <laughs> Like a mouse slip, you know. Oh. And then king yeah. c7, you win. Yeah. Now, here, there's not a non-zero chance. That's true. <laughs> that the game's going to... It's a draw for sure. So if you ever get this position, play here. Trust me. Eventually, somebody will do this against you. Maybe you'll have to do it a thousand times or a million times. You think over the board they would too? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no way. I mean, they'd have to be like... It'd have to be like, you know, seconds left and they're like panicking or something. They're like, what's going on? <laughs> but you might as well give your opponent a chance to make a mistake, even if it's mm -hmm. extremely minuscule chance. That's true. But the point is that white can't force his way through with the king and pawn as long as the black king is in front of the pawn, obviously. C.L. Smith says Nigel Short would win this position. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's not something that my dad told me, actually. It's I saw this position. It happened... Uh, and Yuri Shulman played here. And then somebody asked Yuri, why did you play there? And then he's like, well, my opponent could make a mistake. <laughs> oh, okay. And here they can't make a mistake. So I was like, oh, that's so smart. Mm -hmm, that is no true. wonder he was U.S. champion. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get to be U.S. champion. So Black achieved his goal, but do you know how he did it? Could White improve his play? To understand what's going on, you need some basic knowledge of opposition, right? 
All right. So let's talk about opposition. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about opposition, baby. <laughs> and I'll put the little markings like he puts. Oh, yeah. The quest for dominance between two opposing kings is called opposition, whereby one king tries to become stronger than the other. So in this position, whoever moves loses opposition. And that's the tricky part about opposition, is that you don't want it to be your turn. That's something that is difficult for lower-rated players to understand mm -hmm. when they're starting. I do Great Wolf know a lot of this, but we're just, we just wanted to go through the whole book. So probably next chapter we're getting into some more difficult material. Right, but, as um... a, we've mentioned many, many, <laughs> many times, when we're starting at the beginning of the book, the beginning of the book's easier than later in the book. Yeah, and so, so a lot of it's easy, but... Uh, obviously, you know, some of it I need to review, but yeah, a lot of this I do know. Right, like I'm sure a lot of people in chat wouldn't win Queen Against Knight every time. <laughs> Not every time. Right, yeah, yeah. The diagram illustrates the most basic and direct form of opposition. And he talks a lot about nonsense. Both kings would like to advance, but yeah. In such a situ situation, it's disadvantageous to have the move. Right. Because if you move out of the way, then the opponent can move forward. Or if mm -hmm. I move out of the way, then you can move forward. You know? I like he's giving, like, some variations here. King c6. <laughs> There's nothing on the board. Yes, we got you, he says. So opposition, the point is it allows your king to make advances into the enemy territory. So it doesn't mean anything when it's just king against king. But it can be effective in... Uh, you know, king and pawn endgames especially. So let's go back to the previous position and study it a little bit more deeply than just playing mm -hmm. through the moves. Black to play. <laughs> In this initial position, white is an extra pawn and also possesses opposition because it's black to play. So it sounds good for white, but it's still a dead draw if black stops the king from penetrating uh, to the front of his pawn. Mm -hmm. So if the white king is allowed in front of white's own pawn, then it's going to be potentially a win, almost always a win if that happens. So all black has to do is stop white's king from getting in front of the pawn, and white or black can use opposition himself. So here's a rule. When your king has to step away from the pawn, always go straight back, king d6. Now I will say that these moves actually do draw in this position, but later it won't draw. So you might as well just always go straight back. That's the way to do it. In fact, he even says this. It's not strictly necessary at this stage, but it's good form, yes, to go straight back instead of going this way or that way. Oh, okay. Now when the king steps up, now black gets opposition by right. playing king e6. And this is what's stopping white from being able to step in front of his own pawn, his opposition. And the fact that the pawn is here so you can't, you know, you can't go in front of your own pawn. Like, even if it was Black's turn, Black goes here, it's, it's a draw right now, if this happens. Yeah. Um, he's talking about stuff. Right, whatever. Okay, <laughs> nonsense here, who cares about that? Don't let the king in front of his own pawn unless you have no choice, is what he says. Okay. And yeah, retreating doesn't do anything because you'll just step back in front. So you might as well make progress, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit of drama over here. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> I can't tell if they're joking around or not. Right. <laughs> Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Oh. Are you crying? <laughs> Are you crying? Great. Right. Well, if you only got timed out for 10 seconds, now come right. on. <laughs> By the time I saw he was timed out, I, he already typed a thing. It was yeah, 10, well, I mean, 10 seconds. All, t all people are welcome in this um, stream, but but we do all hate Trump. Like, probably 90% of us, you know. I love Antifa conspiracies. <laughs> a group of like, Wait, that doesn't people. mean you're not welcome. <laughs> and you only got a 10 second ban. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Count yourself lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, you step in front of the pawn. No way that the white king can get in front of the pawn if you're in front of it, right? That's true. Rule, when you st can step in front of your opponent's pawn, do so. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, I didn't mean to make the move. I just meant to get rid of that arrow. Because I obviously take it. 
straight back, right? Mm -hmm. Faithfully adhering to our rule of stepping straight back. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about opposition. You don't want to step this way and then white does step in front yeah. of his pawn and is winning. <clears throat> All right, now this is the do or die situation. Before, black actually could have stepped not in straight back, mm -hmm. but here black can't do that. Black has to step straight back. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to lose. King d8. Yes. Going the other way, like, like this, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, black ran out of territory. He can't go further back. Right. And so he has to step here, only legal move, and now he's going to lose. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's smart earlier to just always step straight back. You know, there's no reason to play badly on purpose just for fun, just because it still happens to draw. Right, yeah. Straight back. Laid back. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And we can step up. And yeah, if it's black to move here, then white would win. But it's white to play. Check. Yeah, sometimes you don't want it to be your turn, especially with regards to opposition. Stalemate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So easy way to draw with the king against the pawn. Definitely something that a lot of people know, but, you know, I, I work at a chess club and I've seen this endgame quite a lot, <laughs> and often people mess it up. Mm, true. Right, we should play king f7 here, exactly. <laughs> Great move. <laughs> well. That's true. Oh, uh, yeah. That's what we would do. <laughs> He doesn't mention that, though. Well, he, he does say any other king move would hang the pawn, but he doesn't mention that you still should do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then we can talk about rook pawns. In most endgames, the presence of a rook pawn uh, gives the defending sides even more drawing chances. Because any, the king can't... It's harder to step in front of a rook pawn since you only have one angle you could come from. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's give an example that would be losing normally, but it's a draw because it's a rook pawn. Like this. So here, white to play. If we shifted everybody over, white wins with g7. Mm -hmm. But here, because it's a rook pawn, h7 is going to stalemate the king. Right. Easy draw. Yeah, black can't play king i7, king yeah. i7, king g7, and wins. <clears throat> so it's a draw. So rook pawns, just in general, I guess are harder to queen if the king gets over there in the corner. Yeah, it's tough for you to, you can't go around exactly. the other way, and your opponent gets stalemated more often. <clears throat> in a king and pawn endgame, rook pawns are tougher to win with. But a lot of times rook pawns are good for... Because it's an outside pass pawn, mm -hmm. which we'll learn more about outside pass pawns, I assume, later in the book. <laughs> yeah, it might be harder for the king to get over and, and maybe if it needs to, to help. Yeah, exactly. Well, a lot of times it. you like just jettison your outside pass pawn. Like, I got an outside pass pawn over here, you have to go take it, then my king can go step up and take all your guys while you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 500 bits from Yay. Cy Bradbury. Thanks, Cy. Thank you, Cy Bradbury. Oh, Bridget says hello. Hey, he Bridget. How's it going? <laughs> Yeah. Hey, do you play too, Bridget? Does Bridget play? <laughs> Rule. King and pawn, king and rook pawn versus lone king, if the defender's king is in front of the pawn, is always a draw. That's true. And then he even says what I said here about if everything was moved over to the left, then it would be a, a win for white, which is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I already said that. Summing up, two knights versus lone kings, a draw. Uh, queen versus bishop is an easy win. Queen versus knight, also an easy win, but you got to watch out for them forks. The king is a strong piece and must be used in the endgame. Opposition is an extremely important tool. Rook pawns add to the defender's drawing chances in most endgames. Nice. Let's see. Still feel like maybe we don't need to do the, the tests. I huh? agree with that. Because these are pretty simple. Materials still a little bit too basic. When we get yeah. a little bit further, we're going to supplement to... Um, yeah, with tests. With some, and maybe even some other puzzles from other books that I have. 
Well, another 100 nice. bits from Nur mm -hmm. Yay. Thanks, Nur. Thank you, Nur. You have to go soon. Any chances for three nights, mate? This might be orange. I don't know. It's sort. It's or like red good orange. Night. Um. No. <laughs> <laughs> three nights, mate, is the most impractical thing to study ever. Wait, hey, there was Cy Bradbury gifting ten subs. Yay! Thanks, Thank Cy. you, Cy Bradbury. Dang. Oh, you made nurse sad. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> More <laughs> Four nice. Even less effective to study. Thank you, Cy Bradbury. <laughs> Cy Bradbury has gone crazy this week on my stream. Thank you. And even on my crazy. dad's stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's Sibley Irresistible. Um. Oh. Nice. Sibley Yay. Irresistible. <laughs> Now, here are some final thoughts. Mastering these easy-to-learn endgames has given you your first taste of serious endgame theory. Yay. That's true. Knowing what can and can't make is a must-know information if you, you know, wish to thrive in the arena of players rated over 1,000. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. So we're already all done with part two. That was a pretty quick one. Yeah, that was quick. Awesome.